Good afternoon and welcome to the Media Freedom Web Webinar, Safety and Independence of Journalists. After some opening remarks today, the, the webinar will include two panels. The first one will discuss physical and digital threats and attacks on journalists and media professionals. The second one will look at the challenges that news media face in retaining their editorial independence. Speakers will also discuss how the COVID-19 crisis has intensified existing problems. The outcomes of today's webinar will feed into the second global conference on media freedom, which will uh, take place online on November 16, 2020, and will be co-hosted by Canada and Botswana. Today's event is organized in partnership by the Federal Minister sorry, Federal Ministry for European and Interna International Affairs of the Republic of Austria, the Embassy of Canada in Vienna, the British Embassy in Vienna, the Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the International Press Institute, IPI. And now I'm glad to present some opening remarks by His Excellency Ambassador Peter Lonsky Tiffenthal, Secretary General of the Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs of the Republic of Austria. Ambassador Lonsky Tiffenthal, please. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to today's webinar on safety and independence of journalists. Thank you for your interest in this critical subject. Please allow me to especially welcome our moderators, the Canadian Ambassador to Austria, Her Excellency Heidi Hulen, and Media Freedom Regional Coordinator, Mr. Kambar Hussein Bohr. Our partners, the International Press Institute and the OACE Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media, as well as all panelists who will be contributing to today's discussions. Thank you for joining us. It indeed gives me great pleasure to open this event since this topic is very dear to my heart. Throughout my professional life, especially in my assignment as Under Secretary General for Public Information at the United Nations, I have held close contact with many courageous journalists and have become acutely aware of the challenges they are facing at times, especially when the subject of their investigation is politically sensitive and of course the ongoing pandemic presents some challenges of its own. Thanks to the dedication of journalists, all of us are provided with essential and important information on issues that affect all our lives. Furthermore, journalists shed light on incidents of violence, torture, discrimination, corruption and misuse of power. In doing so, they give a platform to otherwise unheard voices and hold persons and institutions in power accountable for their actions. Indeed, free, independent and pluralistic media is essential to an open and free society. No nation can develop democratically without the possibility to express opinions and share ideas freely. It is therefore very understandable that the media is often called the fourth pillar of democracy. Freedom of the media is also crucial for the protection and promotion of human rights, thereby contributing significantly to political stability. And yet, we are witnessing a disturbing rise in arrests, persecution and harassment of journalists and media workers, especially women, as well as smear campaigns to discredit their work around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, press freedom is under threat worldwide, including in Europe 
and the European Union. This insight is among the most significant findings contained in the European Commission's first annual rule of law report published last week. The International Press Institute, our partner at today's event, has been monitoring over 400 media freedom violations linked to the COVID-19 coverage alone and counted already 38 deaths of journalists and media staff just this year. Just a few days ago, the news about the tragic death of Russian journalist Irina Slavina were a bitter reminder of the dire situation of journalists. My condolences go out to her family, friends and colleagues at this difficult time. We must ask ourselves what are the work-related factors driving a journalist to take her own life? Attacks against journalists silence important voices in society and thus impede the freedom of opinion. Thereby, they are a danger for democracy. This is why the international community must keep up the pressure towards ending the wide-ranging impunity for such attacks, as long as perpetrators do not have to face consequences, these attacks will continue to be repeated. Thus, Austria has placed the promotion and protection of the freedom of expression and the safety of journalists at the center of its human rights agenda. Last week, a resolution on safety of journalists was adopted by consensus by the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. I am pleased that this has been a joint effort of a cross-regional core group of Austria, Brazil, France, Greece, Morocco, Qatar and Tunisia with 72 co-sponsors from all world regions. The resolution addresses important new issues such as extraterritorial threats, overboard and vague laws, or strategic lawsuits against public participation. It also raises the right of access to information, the problem of surveillance, and toughens its stance on gender-specific threats against journalists. Additionally, the resolution touches upon the safety of journalists in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. I encourage all of you to spread the word and use this resolution to enhance our response to the threats facing journalists. Recognizing the need for more coordinated actions to effectively respond to ongoing challenges faced by journalists and media workers throughout the world, the United Kingdom and Canada launched the Media Freedom Coalition in 2019. They are called to speak out and take action together has been followed by 35 other countries, including Austria. Today's conference takes place in the context of the Media Freedom Coalition and is an opportunity to look at examples on how to tackle threats to the safety of journalists and the rising challenges to their independent work. We will hear first-hand accounts of the constraints journalists and media workers have to deal with when carrying out their important work. International commitments on paper will not suffice. It is vital that governments and civil society join their forces to fight for the safety of journalists. So let us continue our joint efforts to raise awareness and strive for a free, safe and enabling environment for journalists and media workers. Before concluding, let me thank the International Press Institute and the Office of the OAC representative on freedom of the media for their substantial guidance and contribution, as well as my colleagues at the Canadian 
and the UK embassies here in Vienna for this joint initiative. I wish you all an inspiring and fruitful discussion this afternoon. Thank you, Ambassador. I am now glad to present some opening remarks by Lord Ahmad of Wimbledon, Minister for South Asia and the Commonwealth at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. He's also Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's Special Representative on Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict and Minister of State. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the UK, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar to discuss such an important topic, the safety and independence of journalists. I would like to especially thank Their Excellencies, Peter Lewinsky Tiftal and Heidi Hulan, the International Press Institute and the OSC representative on freedom of media for hosting us today, and of course, our distinguished panelists. Media freedom is core to a functioning democracy. It is the foundation for economic prosperity and social development. Yet, media freedom is under attack across the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated existing threats to free and independent media around the world, which was already alarming. Therefore, there is no room for complacency. The UK is strongly committed to championing media freedom globally, and that is why in November 2018, the UK joined Canada in launching the Media Freedom Campaign to shine a global spotlight on media freedom and increase the cost to those who abuse media freedom and persecute journalists. It is why we have provided significant funding towards promoting media freedom and supporting threatened journalists through the Global Media Defence One. It is why we have brought countries together, hosting an international conference and leading discussions at the UN General Assembly to raise the cost for those continuing to abuse journalists. And it is why we support the Media Freedom Campaign. Despite the challenges brought by COVID-19, we have been working through our coalition, the high-level legal panel and partners such as the OSCE and UNESCO to defend both the safety and independence of journalists. Our coalition has spoken out against death sentences for journalists in Yemen and the lack of media freedom in the Philippines and Belarus. We have also called on all countries to take steps to safeguard media freedom during this pandemic. And let me assure you of this, we will not stop advocating for media freedom. We will not rest until those harming journalists are held to account. We will oppose any and all attempts to use this pandemic to restrict press freedom, silence debate, or oppress journalists. Events like this one and the Global Media Freedom Conference in November matter enormously. Together, we can identify and address physical and digital threats and attacks on journalists, and we need to remain unified to support each other's efforts to ensure the safety of journalists in the region and across the world. This is a human rights issue, and the United Kingdom will not waver in our commitment to this essential freedom. Our gratitude to Ambassador Lounsky Tiffenthal and Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon for these inspiring words. We will now move to the first panel of today's Media Freedom Webinar titled Safety of Journalists and Media Workers. The discussion will be moderator, moderated by Kamar Hossein Bor. UK coordinator for the Global Media Freedom Campaign, which is the global effort to mobilize Parliament to speak up for media freedom when it is under attack and help ensure that governments across the world fulfill their obligations to defend it. I'm glad to hand over to you, Mr. Hossein Bor, to introduce the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Before I continue, can I just do a quick sound check and just check people can hear me? Great. Well, it's a real privilege and honor for me to be joining uh, this event. We've heard from uh, ministers from both the UK and Austria on the importance of, of this whole initiative. And I'd like to also uh, applaud uh, the five partner organizations for taking the steps to have this particular event in the build up to 
the Canada Media Freedom uh, Conference taking place on November 16th. Um, I'm going to, in a second, introduce the panellists for this particular session on safety of journalists and media workers. Uh, before I do that, it, 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 it's uh, important to stress that this event, this particular session, we're going to be really focusing on the safety of journalists and media workers, and we've got some great speakers to address this. Uh, as we already know, journalists worldwide are and increasingly have become the target of harassment, intimidation, and violence. Such attacks include threats to them and members of their families, online and offline, as well as expulsion, unlawful or arbitrary arrest and detention, abduction, torture, sexual violence, and in, and in some cases, even murder. Unfortunately, this trend is far from new. Various analyses in recent years by both civil society and international organizations, such as the annual report of that borders reports, have, have noted that there's a growing number of journalists who have been tried on false grounds of espionage, subversion, threat to national security or terrorism, and that slander, libel, and defamation laws were used inappropriately. Journalists were at risk both in and outside the context of armed conflict, and both state and non-state actors committed tax on journalists and media workers. The purpose of such attacks is clear. It is to silence journalists who investigate, document, and report on sensitive issues such as human rights violations, corruption, or organized crime, and other issues of public interests, and in particular, those who hold people in power to account. Women journalists face an additional layer of risk as they're being attacked both as journalists and women. The same is true for journalists representing other marginalized voices. It is therefore crucial to consider the intersectionality of many of the attacks against journalists. Attacks on journalists are therefore not only attacks on individuals concerned, but also on freedom of expression and democracy. It is because of their important role that specific protections is needed. As we've already heard, the COVID pandemic has highlighted and exacerbated many of the existing threats of media freedom, including to the safety of journalists, as various states have introduced measures or special provisions to unlawfully restrict the free flow of information. I'm delighted to say that we've got a panel of distinguished experts, and I'm going to introduce them briefly, and apologies in advance if I'm mispronouncing names. But first, we have Dominic Segara, the co-founder of Open Caucus Media, where he's responsible for organizational development and fundraising. Dominic has worked in journalism for the past five years, and is a specialist in conflict-sensitive reporting. We also have Esther Flieger, who is a journalist and editor at NGO.pl. She has worked with Polish newspaper Gazeta Wyborska, apologies again for mispronunciation, and contributed to various other media, such as The Guardian and BBC News. We also have Andrei Richter, who is a senior legal advisor and former director of the OSCE Office of Representative on Freedom of the Media. He sits on editorial boards of a number of international journals on communication and the media and has authored over 200 publications on media law. We also have Maria Vucic, a reporter at the Crime and Corruption Reporting Network in Serbia. Previously, she was Deputy Editor-in-Chief of the Senslovka Portal and worked as a fact checker of the Centre for Investigative Reporting of Serbia. So a big thank you to all four of our distinguished experts. I'm going to ask a number of questions, and then if we have time at the end, I hope that we can also have some questions and comments taken from all those who are participating online. So perhaps we can start with Andre. Could you give us an overview of the threats journalists are facing today? in particular in Central and Eastern Europe. How has the COVID-19 pandemic amplified these threats? Over to you, Andre. Thank you, moderator. 
Um, indeed, um, the governmental response to COVID and uh, the effects of pandemic uh, brought a number of um, negative things to journalism and, and media freedom in the region or elsewhere in the world. And uh, there were a number of um, international organizations which made reports and uh, provided recommendations to the public and to the governments on what are the threats and what are the problems and what should be the solutions. I should mention uh, the report or uh, the webpage and report by the Interna International Press Institute, one of our organizers, uh, which brought five areas of violation of media freedoms. Um, UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right of Freedom of Opinion uh, spoke about also five challenges to freedom of opinion because of COVID. Uh, OSC, um, my organization, um, or rather one of the institutions of the organization, the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, singled out three areas of concern. And uh, last but not least, uh, five issues were brought by these uh, special mandates of the United Nations Organization of American States and the representative of the OEC on media freedom. If um, I don't have much time, I, I would like to speak about it for 20, 30 minutes. But uh, if I focus just on the restrictions that were brought or rather aggravated during the crisis, uh, I, can, I can single out three major areas based on these reports. Uh, the first will be restrictions on access to information. The second, bans on disinformation. And the third, monopolization of the information flow. And let me more or less quickly explain what I have in mind. The first, restriction on access to information. Uh, all media freedom pioneers claim uh, rightly that access to information is very important for the public to react during the crisis such as pandemic. At the same time, uh, the reports that I used and as well as the practice of the OEC representative for media freedom uh, noted that um, a number of countries introduced restrictions on access to information. And those countries include France, Georgia, Hungary, Italy, Moldova, the Netherlands, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Slovenia, and the United Kingdom. The typical restriction would involve either governments putting on hold all requests on the access of information legislation uh, because of COVID-related policies, or extend the deadlines for providing information generally and generously, uh, uh, until the situation becomes calm and uh, there are more resources to provide access to information to, to the citizens. Uh, there were also attempts to divide in, uh, requests for information for urgent and non-urgent, and there were other tricks, of course, that delayed provision of information uh, to the public. The OEC report mentions only one country, and the, in, the European Federation of Journalists also mentioned this case, that's the case of Ireland, where the government strongly underlined that during the pandemic, the, uh, the deadlines for access to information will, will stay the same. The second um, area of concern are the bans on disinformation. That's not a new thing uh, for Europe. Uh, they started to appear several years ago, but um, this trend was enforced in the past months. And uh, there were a number of cases when the representative of media freedom intervened or tried to intervene uh, in, in the governmental policies. And those are the cases of um, law on coronavirus in Hungary, a presidential decree in Romania, amendments to the uh, criminal code in Russia, um, and some other cases where uh, the government, the parliaments tried to uh, increase penalties for spread of disinformation and also try to expand the scope of what is this information to as much as possible. What is also important to understand, to understand in this context is that according to UN representative on uh, freedom of expression, governments themselves quite often uh, were involved in disseminating disinformation. So with one hand, 
stopping this information of others with the other hand basically disseminating their own uh, this information on COVID. And uh, what is important also to understand that those bans and limitations, although introduced and explained by COVID and pandemic, were not designed to stay just for the period of, of, of uh, countering pandemic. They were designed, they are designed to stay forever, for as long as, uh, as the parliament will, will support and, and the government will support it. And the last, the third uh, area of concern is monopolization of information flow, where some states monopolized the flow of information about the pandemic. And in a way, this can be also viewed as an attempt to see what will happen if such monopolization happens in, takes place in, in, in other areas. Um, indeed, uh, some countries made such attempts, uh, and I can list countries where um, uh, the OSC intervened, that was Armenia, Serbia, Russia. There were cases also in Azerbaijan, Greece, and Turkey, when uh, basically what happened, the states either banned medical workers or unofficial representatives of the profession to speak about this, the scope, origin, uh, cure of the pandemic. Uh, there were also attempts to harass, discriminate, or punish those media and journalists that tried to bring alternative viewpoints and alternative statistics, alternative data on, the, um, on COVID. That's why um, the uh, Council of Europe Secretary General said uh, in one of her very important statements that official communications cannot be the only information channel about the pandemic. This would lead to censorship and suppression of legitimate concerns. Journalists, media, medical professionals, civil society activists, and public at large must be able to criticize the authorities and scrutinize their response to the crisis. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very useful overview. Um, we'll, we'll move on swiftly. If I can bring at this stage, uh, Maria, uh, you are reporting, as I understand, about organized crime and corruption. Uh, we'd be interested to know what measures are you and your organization taking to ensure your own safety. Over to you, Maria. Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, we are, as a newsroom that investigates organized crime and corruption, which are very hot topics, if I can say that. Uh, and uh, we are often targeted by politicians, officials, and sometimes criminals, etc. some uh, dangerous people, maybe. So we have to, uh, and of course, we are being followed by the state and uh, um, by the security service of Serbia, we believe. So we are very cautious when it comes to our um, uh, safety and when it comes to our, um, um, our communication, for example, when we have something important to talk about. We do not talk about our stories, about our articles, about things we do at the moment. We do not talk about that in the office ever. Uh, when we have to discuss those, those things uh, in, uh, regarding our investigations, we go out without our cell phones. We talk about those things uh, in private, like in, in, in four eyes without cell phones and uh, communication and uh, out of the office. Uh, of course, we, we've been trained to um, recognize when someone is, uh, is following us uh, like physically in the street, uh, etc. We are very cautious when it comes to chatting on social media uh, and everything uh, in that sense because it's really um, it's really dangerous actually to be a journalist not only in Serbia a journalist that works on highly sensitive topics but in the whole world. So every journalist have to know a few things that he he or she can do in order to protect himself and his communication, uh, etc. And uh, I would like to mention that uh, the previous speaker uh, talked about Serbia, mentioned Serbia a few times uh, relating to COVID crisis. Um, I would like to um, once again uh, tell, tell the public, uh, inform the public about one unremembered and shameful case we had during COVID uh, pandemics in Serbia. I believe that happened in May. We had this uh, information restriction and monopolization by the government, etc. 
uh, as in, in the whole world, I, I believe. But we also had one case where the journalist Anna Lalic uh, was arrested after her article um, about the lack of COVID equipment in uh, se clinical center, one of biggest clinical centers, state clinical centers, medical institutions in Serbia. She was arrested, which is, uh, I, I don't know, the exception, something like that didn't happen for years in Serbia. And uh, she, she uh, I was talking to her and she told me that they, they took her mobile phone uh, police, when they came to arrest her, they, they took her mobile phone, her laptop, and she didn't, she didn't expect that, and she didn't have uh, enough knowledge about um, how to protect her communication with sources. So the whole communication with her sources for that story were actually like given to the police because she didn't protect that, that with password or encrypted that communication, etc. So that's one important case where actually if you're not, important example that shows that if you're as a journalist not conscious enough uh, and do not know um, how to protect yourself, uh, you, can, you can be in very huge problem if a police uh, comes to your apartment and what, what is I believe uh, the problem for, bigger problem for every journalist, a bigger problem than it's uh, my own safety, uh, it's uh, the safety of my, of my sources. So uh, in order to protect their sources and to protect you, you have to like take some measures uh, to, to protect your communication, um, mo mobile phone and uh, laptops and etc. Great, well, well thank you very much. Uh, a sobering reminder of the realities journalists face on the front line. At this point, if I can bring Dominic in, uh, I understand that you wrote about your colleague Zahlab D. Geria, a Chechen journalist who was facing dubious charges around drugs in September 2016. At the time, you said, I fear every day that something could happen um, to meet reporters in Chechnya and other republics of the North Caucasus. The risks they face are beyond comprehension. Could you tell us a little bit about how that situation has developed and do you still remain worried? Over to you, Dominic. Uh, yes, absolutely. The situation in the North Caucasus is catastrophical. Like right now, we have reached a situation when some parts of the region have become informational black zones. So there is almost no verified information uh, leaving this region, like number one, of course, being Chechnya. Jalavdi was Jalavdi Giriev was one of the last journalists uh, like who operated in Chechnya. Like he was, like he worked under a fake name. He didn't write about any sensitive topics. It was quite, let's say, uh, like daily journalist journalism about something that happened in Grozny. Like nothing very controversial. Not going after the assets of Kadyrov or political topics and so on. Like still, he like there was mock execution uh, on the cemetery, uh, drugs planted, and after he survived, like no one was, like everybody was happy that he was just alive because the moment he disappeared, everybody presumed that, that, that this would end in death. Uh, so right now in Chechnya, we don't have practically any independent journalists left. Like the all the journalists I worked with have left. Uh, in, they are in hiding and they cannot continue working. Uh, the only way is to work online uh, using your network of sources, but it raises a lot of questions about the fact checking of the information. So like very often you will read that when something happens to Chechnya, the source are WhatsApp groups, or this is what people are saying. Uh, like there is no mechanism to verify this information. Uh, and that can also be turned against us by the authorities, like discrediting journalism even further. Like if journalists make a mistake and they can somehow prove that uh, this information wasn't correct, that was given by media. Then in the other republics, the situation is a bit more nuanced. Uh, contrary to the common belief, Dagestan is somewhat an island of civil society and media freedom in the North Caucasus. 
and maybe even for Russia. Like, of course, it's not, the situation is not great. Like, it's not like in Georgia, it's not like in Armenia. But given the general circumstances in North Caucasus, like, it's not bad. Like, there are several media outlets that are quite reputable. There is genuine societal debate happening through social media on even the most sensitive topics. Uh, so there are some civil society organizations and protest movements, like mostly organic, that are trying to exercise direct pressure on the authorities. But then uh, in Dagestan, you never know when the authorities will try to uh, send a message to the civil society and media. So like most recent case is a journalist and editor of respected Dagestani daily, Chernavik. Uh, Abdul Mumin Gadzhiev, who was arrested on extremism charges, which is after drug charges, the second favorite charge of the Russian authorities. In Ingushetia, media appeared only very recently, like before I don't think we can speak of like, independent media what's or quality media, like there was pretty much only republishing official statements and telegram groups. The like real media appeared following the conflict with Chechnya over the border areas uh, where Chechnya took long, large chunks of Ingushetia and declared them as part of Chechnya. Uh, like pretty much most people who were responsible for running this media had to flee uh, Ingushetia and Russia completely. So they didn't have a chance to operate. And in other republics, the media landscape is so barren and the level is so low that it's very difficult to find or verify information as well. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Like the situation is quite dramatic. Uh, if there are any journalists, like they are likely to flee in several years. Like I myself evacuated three or four journalists from Russia, uh, like who were working with OC Media. Um, and other structural factors, like terrible pay, like no chances for professional development. Like the only thing that can push you is pure heroism. There are no other incentives. Like the landscape is so bad. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dominic. Uh, a, a, a description of some very difficult working environments, but also the adaptive techniques journalists are trying to undertake with the challenges that that brings to them. If I can at this point bring in Esther, who has written about some high profile political developments in her native Poland. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about your experiences of reporting on these developments? Over to you, Esther. Hello, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy that I can be here. And yeah, I think we live in populism era. Uh, not only in Poland, it's uh, a global trend and uh, populism is very, very big threat to, to f safety and freedom of uh, journalism. And uh, I don't have any magic uh, solution, but when I'm thinking uh, what journalist I want to be, uh, I always said that in this populist time, we just need to do our job. And uh, there's a book I'm looking always inspiration in. It's a book about, of Timothy Snyder. I have a Polish edition uh, about tyranny, 20 lessons from uh, 20th century. And uh, there's a lesson in nine, uh, take care about language uh, that you use. And Snyder is writing for journalists, but also for all citizens. And uh, he's writing that uh, express yourself in your very own unique way in this populist uh, time. Find the language you, you speak. And uh, he's, always, uh, he's also writing about um, another danger in populist uh, time. Uh, he, Timothy Snyder is writing that uh, in this populist time, we don't see the whole ocean, we see only uh, waves. Uh, every news is breaking and in another minute, there's another news uh, breaking. So uh, I believe that being a good journalist is in this populist time, you need to be a specialist in your one very particular field. You can't be an expert on everything. So uh, I'm trying to, to focus on my field, which is uh, past and history as a tool in, uh, uh, populist uh, narration. 
so this is my first thought that you just to do your job and be a specialist don't comment on everything focus on your field and then do your job and uh, in Poland uh, also there is a very big danger which is Polish Polish war since 2010 it's 10 years now uh, we have uh, this extremely high level of emotions in Polish public life and uh, yeah we call it Polish Polish war and uh, there are like two groups of people who fighting each other two main parties and uh, unfortunately they are trying to uh, engage people also journalists in their own political uh, political war and it's very very um, very dangerous because many journalists try to to find a place in this uh, in this war and to support one of the sides uh, but our job is not to support political uh, sides of this conflict, just uh, sometimes we need to say something unpopular in your bubble, let's say. And bubbles, yes, that's, that's, that's another very um, big danger for freedom and safety of uh, journalism. So um, another thing in uh, Poland which I want to talk about is public media. Uh, because since 2015, when Law and Justice, which is populist uh, right-wing party, won the election, we have a revolution in public media. Uh, many journalists lost their job who, who used to work in uh, public media. And uh, public media in Poland now are quite similar, like in Hungary or even in Russia. Uh, if you close your eyes and imagine something really, really impossible and double it, this is public media in Poland now. It's really like Russia today. And uh, every day uh, public TV makes these emotions uh, even higher and higher. And uh, yeah, it's very, very, very um, dangerous that these emotions, we, we share these emotions. And uh, so I, I would say that what's, what's the most difficult for, for journalists in Poland is to, to be yourself and not to, to be on one side. Just do your job and you have to, to have your own uh, opinions. And uh, of course, government is threatening from time to time, exactly like in Hungary, that uh, there will be no uh, free media anymore in Poland. Uh, I mean, every time some journalists uh, write or publish something critical to Polish government, they can uh, hear from government that uh, they are working in German language media or in German capital media. So Polish government is uh, trying to, uh, to do something about capital uh, of, of media in Poland. Uh, like exactly one week ago, uh, Polish vice, uh, vice prime minister and uh, minister of culture and sport uh, Piotr Gliński, he said that uh, Polish government, uh, Polish state-owned companies should buy uh, media who are independent. And The Economist published an article that uh, Polish oil company, Orlen, is talking to a press group and press group owns media, local media, media in small towns, in small, uh, in small local areas. So, uh, yeah, Polish, Polish government is looking for a way to, to make the same revolution as, as did Hungarians. So this is also very risky because if Polish government would buy uh, local media, journalists working there, they are in danger of losing jobs because if they will not uh, write uh, the truth or they will be critical to Polish government, they, they can lose uh, lost jobs. But still, of course, uh, there are always, there are, they are always, um, it's also, it's only a threat, but we have no idea when second Budapest will be uh, in Warsaw. Great. Well, well thank you, Esther, uh, for reflecting on your own experiences, reporting in a, in a very politicized and often very emotional uh, context. Um, for everyone else who's viewing, uh, I propose one more round of questions for our distinguished experts, and then hopefully we'll open it up or questions and comments from everyone participating. And so for all our experts, I'll ask you one more question. I'll be grateful if we can keep the responses relatively brief so we can allow time for our participants to engage as well. Can I come back to you, Andre? Um, when it comes to state actors trying to repress media freedom, what are some of the strategies that you and your team have observed in recent years? And how does this manifest itself in the context 
of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Andre. Thank you, moderator. I'll try to be relatively brief uh, as requested. And um, I would like to name only one trend, which uh, I think uh, was intensified with, um, with the pandemic in the pandemic context. And there is a trend to establish by some of the governments um, a form of a monopoly on truth. And uh, what is true and what is not true. Again, I say uh, it is not purely COVID-19 phenomenon, but definitely it was uh, intensified, especially when you think about the reasons why the governments would uh, make restrictions in those three areas which I mentioned before. Is it really concern about public health or not? And um, the more you think, uh, the more you come to the idea of, uh, of a monopoly of truth or monopoly on communication or monopoly on, on, on the media in a way. I mean, all these elements are related, but I would like to focus exactly on monopoly on truth. What I have in mind is that um, uh, the decision of what is true and what is false, I mean, those are quite philosophical ideas, uh, are decided more and more by the government authorities. And um, I, I read a very interesting report by a Russian um, human rights group by name Agora, published in Russian and in English in the summer, which uh, provided uh, case law confirming that criteria of truth and legality of speech has become uh, dependent on whether the government confirmed it or didn't confirm it. Uh, the author of the report wrote, from now on, information coming from authorized officials is presumed to be reliable and lawful. On the contrary, any unofficial socially significant information is considered unlawful until it has been confirmed by the state. And the more significant this information, the greater the risks for those who disseminate it. This is a report about COVID, but the conclusions are made much wider than, uh, than the uh, COVID context itself. Of course, such a wish of the government or such a policy of the government is not sufficient unless there is a tendency to monopolize the media or as as many researchers use this phrase today, media capture by the government. And uh, they're talking not only about Russia, but about a number of uh, countries in Eastern and Central Europe, where the governments capture the media, public service media uh, and private media in order to manipulate information and uh, in the end manipulate the public. There is also another very remarkable theory um, recently in uh, that came up in the recently published works about information and autocracy. When the governments choose uh, propaganda and choose uh, state control of broadcasters and other media and censoring private media as a very uh, money sufficient, uh, money efficient, I'm sorry, money efficient method of controlling the population. Uh, so features of this monopoly, such as states requiring reporting along predefined lines, were recently noted by the Council of Europe, which warned, again in the context of COVID, that um, government discretion to decide what is correct and what is false information can lead to censorship and suppression of legitimate concerns. This is dogma, but this can be put in reverse order censorship and suppression of legitimate concerns can lead to government's discretion to decide what is correct and what is false. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, Andre. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on now and maybe bring in Dominic. Um, you've talked about in the past the foreign agent narrative, which you have described as gaining ground and currency throughout Central and Eastern Europe. Do you still believe this to be the case? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think a lot has been told about the foreign agent narrative in Russia and the rest of Eastern Europe. But using the occasion, I would like to 
say something uh, topical about uh, the voice of peacemakers and how these people are currently being made into foreign agents into our regions, like which can very clearly be seen in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, we saw this problem in Georgia before, like OC Media works with people and journalists on all sides of conflict divides and noticed that even where there is no mechanism for uh, government to exercise pressure on voices that criticize the policy towards conflict or militarization or the nationalism, uh, there is huge internal censorship and pressure uh, from especially civil society like not to pursue this line and not to go direction. Like there is a huge pressure on not engaging in dialogue with the other side. Uh, for Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which are very small places under very heavy influence of Russia, where the memory of war is very much alive, like the war in the end happened in their territory. And a lot of people after all these years are still very directly affected by everything that happened. Uh, it's somehow understandable. But in Georgia, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, this trend has been very worrying. I think right now we can see the results watching the uh, war between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh where uh, any sort of decent criticizing the military approach to conflict, like this is especially on the Azerbaijani side, is tantamount to being a traitor, like to betraying one or own country. There were cases of people who spoke against uh, the military solution of the conflict, being questioned by the authorities, like summoned for conversation, uh, like journalists have experienced a lot of pressure like from their colleagues from civil society like from society in general uh, so it's very difficult in this situation to report anything else than the official statements like what becomes the norm is that the official statement by the government uh, something similar what Andre talked about although without any formal regulation like it becomes the norm anyone needs to adhere to. Uh, in Armenia, like which always had much higher media freedom levels than Azerbaijan, the martial law has been amended approximately a week ago, which now forbids uh, media to criticize any actions of the government, authorities, military, and so on. So uh, like the media, right now is practically paralyzed but when it comes to reporting anything else which is not related to war but also of course related to war and that translates to uh, the more armenian problem where the criticism of the war itself uh, like of course is very natural because other armenians in nagorno-karabakh are in the position of uh, defending themselves but when it comes, like, so it's easy to speak for the ceasefire. But again, uh, the situation mirrors the situation in Azerbaijan when discussing the solution to the conflict beyond ceasefire, trying to find sustainable peace, like admitting that Armenia side hasn't done enough like, to reach any sort of solution. Like these voices are also silenced. So right now, after... 30 years of this conflict being not really frozen, just low intensity, with millions of dollars being spent on media, on NGOs, on dialogue. Like it seems that everything was in vain because you can count people who are ready to publicly say very basic things, like we shouldn't bomb each other's cities, we should sit down and talk, like maybe we should. Uh, Maybe we should accept and admit that we caused harm to the other side, that their grievance has some legitimacy. Like very simple things. Uh, you can count people who are ready to say it out loud in public, maybe on the fingers of your both hands. Uh, so in this sense, like we don't even need laws on foreign agents in the Caucasus. Because when the crisis comes, our media and our societies are not resilient to this sort of conflict. Like the problem lies something deeper, and this issue needs to be addressed on a deeper level. 
and the authorities need to be on board because only foreign involvement, only foreign help is not enough. And when the crisis actually comes, the support from abroad to these voices is very, very minimal. Thank you very much, Don. Make a clear exposition of the challenges of reporting in a conflict, uh, a live conflict, I might add. Um, we've got about 20 minutes or so. I've got two more questions for our panelists, and then I'll, I'll open up for Q and A. And um, as we know, one group of journalists who face a particular challenge are female journalists who face a challenge by virtue of not only being journalists but women as well, and they increasingly facing abuse and harassment online. Uh, Maria, can I start with you on this? And I'm pleased that we have a panel which does include two female journalists. You've spoken publicly about being attacked online, including in the documentary A Dark Place by the OSC. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about your experience as a woman journalist and what happened? Oh, well, it happened that I uh, received uh, a death threat in my Facebook inbox. Um, in books on Facebook after I published an article about uh, some uh, movie documentary movie uh, uh, projection in one uh, in one uh, cultural center in Serbia which was interrupted by some right-wing activists they were shouting they were uh, insisting on uh, that the premiere to to uh, to to be finished because it's uh, it's it's that movie is about Albanian women. Uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but Serbs and Albanians have had many conflicts in the past. So it's very sensitive topic when it comes to our relations with Albanians. It's very sensitive, and this is a documentary that were uh, titled "Albanian Women Are Our Sisters." So I anticipated that after that uh, article about about this. Uh, I might have some threats because people don't want to see an article about um, about uh, right wing activists being called uh, violent, uh, etc. Um, and um, after I published that, uh, I received this uh, death threat. Someone sent me that I'm going to be killed with a sword. And uh, I, th this is an anonymous profile and what scared me actually was that uh, my Facebook account in that time, I, I don't have Facebook anymore, but uh, back in that time my Facebook account was uh, locked, my profile was locked and uh, no one could see that I work in that particular newsroom, there was no any, uh, personal information about me, I even didn't, didn't have clear picture uh, and I'm not a public figure, my face is not uh, well known to the public. So someone had to spend some time researching on Facebook uh, and to find my profile. So that, that, that was a little bit creepy. Uh, I, I think that happened in 2016 or 2017, I'm not sure anymore. And uh, I reported that to, uh, the, we have this prosecutor for a high tech crime. And they told me that uh, they're going to take my, uh, my case uh, like an, they're going to treat it like a, an urgent matter because I'm a journalist uh, and uh, after that I don't have any communication with them I do not know what happened with that uh, case it's been three years and they're still not, uh, I'm, not I'm, I'm not sure they they didn't ever call me to give some kind of statement to, in the police or um, anything like that and I don't know what happened to that case I mean if they're not capable of solving that kind of um, threat um how can they be you know like uh, how can they solve more serious attacks on journalists uh, and there are many of attacks uh, many attacks on journalists in serbia much more serious than than this mine but you know when they fail uh in solving this um basic cases we certainly cannot have any assurance we cannot believe that they're going to solve many other things um, for example, my colleague from, from my newsroom, Dragana Pecho, her apartment was uh, burgled a few years ago, a year and two years ago, I, I'm not sure. Someone entered her apartment, took nothing. She had some valuable possessions like laptops, etc. Um, they pulled everything out of drawers and uh, like their clo her clothes and documents, uh, but they didn't take anything. 
it's clear that it was some kind of uh, like uh, someone wanted to endanger her to uh, to warn her that she should stop reporting on particular uh, things and of course our police didn't uh, didn't solve that they they actually made a statement a few days after that saying that there are many of these uh, thieves operating in her neighborhood and in that way they um, they like it's the relativization of um, this event and of like uh, safety uh, safety of journalists matter in Serbia uh, basically they told we are not going to take this seriously so that's the situation in Serbia that's our real reality they are not able to um, solve um, in my impression almost nothing uh, when it comes to to endangering journalists unfortunately well, thank you, Maria. And I think I'm sure I share everyone's sentiments about how, how harrowing it must have been to, to have such messages sent to you and uh, the difficulties you must have experienced there. Um, moving on to you, Esther, and this is the last question for the panel from me. Um, have you had similar experiences uh, insofar as your own uh, your professional work in life is concerned? Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I said, I'm writing about the past, which is very sensitive area in Poland. And um, as I said, the uh, past is a tool in populists' hands. And uh, I'm also active on uh, Twitter. So, uh, two years ago, when I was writing a lot about uh, Polish-Jewish relations and uh, Polish-Jewish relation, relations, particularly about, uh, about past, about history, uh, I experienced a lot of uh, hate and uh, um, really, really a lot. Uh, every day I found some comments like, uh, I'm not Polish, uh, I should leave Poland and go to Israel. I even remember some really ridiculous comments like, how many child Palestine children you kill every day? Uh, because my name is Esther Figarias and that's, I'm not even Jewish. That, that was the, the most uh, ridiculous uh, thing that I experienced, some antisemitism not even being uh, Jewish, but every day. And uh, of course there were such message on my messenger in this uh, files, different, yeah. So I, I found every day some comments that said that I should leave Poland and not comment Polish uh, history. So yeah, it was, it was quite intensive uh, time. I also remember in 2017 one official, very serious official, who uh, was following my uh, academic career, who was publishing some information about my, uh, let's say, private things on Twitter because I published article about him. So uh, yeah, he was some, like every day publishing some informations he, he was looking or also he said something that I, I was studying the, uh, at this time, so he, he published some threatens that I should, I should be careful if I will finish studies, something like this. So uh, yeah, you see how past is really sensitive. And uh, I, also, uh, I also remember from a few months ago a situation, uh, I was writing about World War II Museum in Gdańsk, which is a very big conflict about this museum in uh, Poland. And uh, I was uh, writing about this museum and I, comment, uh, I, I quoted one uh, very good historian, very good professor who's a specialist in World War II history. And uh, this museum uh, director uh, decided to go to a court against this professor because I quoted him. So uh, he wanted to threaten my sources, my uh, people who I'm talking to. Uh, he wanted to make them not talk to me because uh, he would have to pay like a lot of money for this uh, conversation. Luckily, uh, this uh, this case didn't find uh, find a final in court. He decided to not to do it. But uh, anyway, uh, there was a risk that uh, the historian who I'm talking, who I'm quoting, he will have to pay for his opinion, which is quite also uh, ridiculous. Uh, so um, I also have some comments like. Um, that I'm woman, so I shouldn't um, shouldn't uh, have any opinion about uh, history. But uh, what I found 
I found hope because now it's not the same like two years ago or one year ago. I see a little bit difference that I don't know, maybe they get used to uh, me and my writing. But uh, yeah, it's like two years ago when there was a very big diploma crisis between Poland, USA and uh, Israel, I, 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 I had such experience. Great. Well, nice to end on a positive note there, albeit yes. difficult to get, get to the place where you have been. We've got about nine minutes left now. I'm going to ask, try and ask each panellist one question. And forgive me for this, but if you could give me minutes of your time so we can try and fit in as much as we can. Uh, Andre, uh, we've got a question broadly framed in the chat about saying that we're focusing a lot on Central Eastern Europe. But OSCE is not really doing much on what's happening in Western and Northern American countries. I think you may be best placed to respond to that. Could you, could you briefly give us a sense of your take on that? Yeah, I like this diversions of our conversations into geography and, and, uh, and uh, instead of, of focusing on the topics. Uh, I believe that uh, definitely myself and uh, but also other speakers focused not on a particular country, but focused on particular problems, uh, which are not unique to one country, whether this country is east of Vienna or west of Vienna. And, uh, and I think the whole concept of what is east of Vienna and what is west of Vienna is a bit rotten, because some of the countries which are geographically to the east uh, are doing things which are more similar to the country to the what the countries to the west of Vienna are doing so uh, my answer is that uh, that is not true and uh, my answer is that uh, if there are cases in certain western countries uh, which uh, the person who raised the question wants to bring to the attention she should rather do that than uh, accuse others of uh, some sort of disbalance, especially geographical disbalance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. And in the interest of transparency, I'm glad we're addressing points like this. But as you noted, it's not about geography, it's about the issue. Um, Dominic, we've got a question about many journalists assassinated by organized criminal groups every year. Do you think the international community is paying enough attention to journalists being who are killed by organized criminal groups? Can I bring you on this, Dominic? Yes, uh, I specialize in the Caucasus. Uh, I cannot comment on other countries and definitely not about countries outside of Europe. Uh, from what I see, like we have a lot of outrage over killings of investigative journalists, like the killings of journalists in Bulgaria and uh, Italy, uh, like were probably killed by, and Slovakia, like killed by organized crime, uh, like received a lot of coverage. Uh, so, I, I don't think I can contribute anything more. Like, the, this is not an issue for the Caucasus. Okay, thank you for that. We have a question uh, um, on the specific challenges facing journalists in the context of public protests. Um, I was wondering, Esther, if I could bring you on this really. What's your view on the challenges facing journalists in the context of public protests? Uh, can I ask for a repeating question? Because I had some technical problem. Well, the question is, what, what are the specific challenges facing journalists in the context of public protests? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, we talked today a lot about uh, the very big danger of monopolizing media, uh, for example, uh, in Poland. So, uh, I think that in time of protest, if media will be not independent, it will be very difficult to uh, to uh, writing about uh, protest and uh, in public television, for example, in Poland, protests don't exist. Uh, everything is fine and everybody supports government. Uh, tomorrow um, in Poland, there will be a decision about uh, making abortion law uh, even harder. So there will be there will there will be a lot of protests even if if they are only possible in this pandemic time. So. Uh, I believe that um, protest is essence of uh, journalism. I mean, uh, writing about it, and um, but it's a big challenge in pandemia time, first of all, and first, and second thing in this uh, threat of uh, lack of independence. Um, it, it, yeah, if I, yeah, that's it. 
Great. And last but not least, if I can bring in uh, uh, Maria, uh, we have a, a, a follow-up question related to that, which is, you know, how can international standards be strengthened and what specific rights for journalists should they be set out in your view? Well, internationally, I'm not sure what should, uh, what can international community do uh, to improve situation in particular countries. I think that um, as some, some, some previous speaker said, there is an outrage when international outrage when something happens. Uh, for example, in Serbia, when we had this um, uh, arrest of this journalist, we had reactions from reporters without borders, etc. Um, European Commission, uh, etc. I believe this is uh, the issue of national government. So this is, it's a question for us, for, for Serbia or Poland, or I don't know, what can we do as a society? Um, do we have a will to do anything, actually, a political will to do anything to improve the uh, position of, of journalists? So it, my, I, my hopes are, are going that, in that direction. I believe it's our own um, matter we should, we should work on. Thank you, Maria. A very important reminder that notwithstanding international support, action and obligations always rest at the state level, and that's something that we can't ignore. I'm conscious of time, and I'm also conscious that there are a number of other questions in the chat room, which range as sort of far and bright, wide as Kashmir to Venezuela. Um, but you know, I'm, I don't think our panelists are probably have got the regional expertise to comment on all those. Uh, but in the interest of time, I just want to wrap up this discussion. Uh, it's been a very rich and useful reflections on the challenges facing journalists on the front line. We've heard first-hand accounts from our distinguished experts about the threats they've faced, the steps that they have taken, but we've also worryingly heard about some of the trends happening within both the North Caucasus, but also within Europe more generally about the challenges journalism is facing uh, as an entity and what are the tactics that states are using. So I just want to once again thank the organisers of this event for bringing this panel together, for giving us all a chance to hear from them firsthand about the importance of the journalism, but also the challenges that journalists face. And thank you also to participants who have been very patient. Apologies to all those who maybe didn't have the chance to get their questions answered, but I'm sure that during the course of this particular session and other sessions, there'll be lots more opportunities to engage with the panels. So once again, thank you to you and everyone else. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Kanbara Hossein Bohr for your great moderation. And, and thanks to Dominic Tsagara, Esther Fliga, Andrea Vichta, and Maria Vucic for really interesting remarks and for stressing the need to develop stronger mechanisms to better protect uh, journalists. So, uh, we will now take a 12 minutes um, break. Please remain connected while we prepare for the next panel. Uh, the next panel will look at media independence. So if you get disconnected, you can use the same link to come back into the event. Um, I will leave you with some slides about the Media Freedom Coalition, an important initiative that sees the participation of our three partners for today, Canada, the UK and Austria, among other 35 countries, um, as well as a short film about the work of the OSC Office of the Representatives of Freedom of the Media. And I will see you again at uh, 1555 Central European Summer Times for the second panel. Thank you very much.
Welcome back to the second part of the Media Freedom Webinar on safety and independence of journalists. For those of you who joined just recently, a reminder that this event is jointly organized by the Federal Ministry for European Internet and International Affairs of the Republic of Austria, the Embassy of Canada in Austria, the British Embassy in Austria, the OSCE Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media, and the International Press Institute. The next panel looks at challenges that news media outlets face in their effort to cover the news independently, as external pressure and interference have been increasing in many countries around the world, both as a consequence of today's political climate, as well as the added economic stress generated by the COVID-19 crisis. The panel will be moderated by Her Excellency Heidi Hulan, Ambassador of Canada to Austria and the international organizations in Vienna. Ambassador Hulan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, nodding heads. Good. Good sign. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and everyone participating, and especially to uh, our, our second um, panel and the panelists on it. Uh, which will focus on the independence of the media. Uh, free, independent, uh, and, and pluralistic media play a really indispensable role uh, in informing the public, of course, at all times, but perhaps uh, especially in times of, of crisis. Uh, the Media Freedom Coalition uh, believes very strongly that everyone should have the right to comprehensive, accessible, and timely and reliable information. 
During the COVID pandemic, we've seen that trust and in information obtained through the media and provided by the media is absolutely crucial to uh, achieving uh, general public support for measures that uh, need to be taken to uh, curb the, uh, the virus and, and its spread. Uh, and and uh, reasonable compliance uh, with uh, reasonable measures. Uh, in some incest, in some instances, access to reliable and pluralistic information can even be a matter of life and death. Generally speaking, trust cannot be achieved without the transparency and accessibility and the accountability provided by journalists and uh, free media that is capable of holding those in power to account. Equally, a free and independent media has a very important role to play in countering disinformation by providing access to accurate, fact-based, verified information. However, attempts uh, media independence and sustainability is increasingly uh, under pressure, a point which I thought was very neatly underscored in the last panel when Maria Vucic uh, spoke about the kind of everyday measures that she and her colleagues are having to take to protect themselves, which I think we would all agree is very far removed from what we would describe as a, a, an independent uh, and, and free media uh, ecosystem. Uh, increasing attempts to influence, delegitimize, or pressure media and journalists or their sources in this manner, as well as the changing media landscape, including a shift online and with the, the increasing dominance of a few very large uh, players, is additionally pressuring quality media. With me to discuss these issues, I'm very pleased to, to welcome uh, the following speakers. We have with us today. Scott Griffin, Deputy Director at the uh, International Press Institute here in Vienna, a global network of editors, media executives, and leading journalists that defends press freedom and independent journalism. Uh, Martin Gargali, I hope I got that right, uh, is lead editor of Hungary's largest current affairs weekly, HBG. Uh, he spent uh, 13 years at, uh, at, at Nepsa Vadzeg, I apologize for crucifying that, uh, that title, Hungary's most widely read uh, daily newspaper. He was appointed deputy editor-in-chief when production ended as a result of a politically motivated takeover in October 2016. Mira Milosevic is the executive director at Brussels-based Global Forum for Media Development. She leads their engagement with the United Nations, the Internet Governance Forum, and other multilateral institutions, as well as the international, their international efforts advocating for the sustainability of journalism and news media. Natalia Morari is an investigative journalist and co-founder and president of the board for TV8, one of the few independent TV channels in Moldova. In 2007, she was expelled from Russia and banned from entering that country for almost five years following a series of investigations about money laundering. Uh, I would like to just very warmly welcome all of you here uh, today, uh, panelists, and, uh, and, and thank you for spending uh, some time with us to explore uh, the issue of the independence of media. Uh, I, I'd like to um, proceed in the manner of the first panel by asking a series of questions of our panelists. Uh, we'll moderate it in this way. Uh, at the end of the, the panel, I hope there will be time to take some questions from uh, participants to this event. Uh, and I would just encourage you all to, anyone who's watching this, to place your questions in the Q&A box uh, on this, this system so that we can follow them uh, as, as, as closely as possible. To kick off our panel, I'd like to, I'd like to start with you, Scott. Um, could you give us your, your assessment on the state of independent media in Europe, but also globally, you know, just a, a kind of a fire starter for the, the panel, and specifically your views on how the current crisis uh, has affected them? Over to you. Sure, uh, thanks very much, Ambassador Ruan, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Hope you can all hear me well. Um, no, I mean, the, I think the general, the general message is that, you know, the state of independent media, both in Europe and also globally, is deeply challenged. And, and that was the case also before the pandemic, uh, which has, uh, however, worsened the situation. Um, and I think it's important to underscore, you know, what do we mean by, when we 
we talk about independent journalism, uh, what is that? And, and I think the first thing is to say that, you know, the, the most important condition for independent journalism, in our view, is, is the ability of journalists to operate free from, in, free from retaliation and, and, and free from interference. Uh, and so the growing attacks that we see on the press around the world, which are, you know, jailings, politically driven prosecutions, criminalization of journalism, uh, killings, physical attacks, smear campaigns, targeted disinformation, uh, and of course now everything that we've seen with the pandemic, such as these new restrictions on so-called fake news, all of these are attacks on independent, on independent journalism. Uh, because a press that is under attack, a press that is under threat from self-censorship, or, or that is operating in a state of fear, isn't, isn't independent. Uh, and, and I think that this, is, this has been one of the biggest uh, things to come out of the pandemic, as I think was mentioned in the earlier panel. Uh, we've been tracking attacks on the press since the start of the pandemic, uh, and we've recorded over 400 violations uh, globally. Uh, and, and, and so all of this, you know, these massive, this massive rise in attacks on the press uh, that we are seeing um, is partly a result of the pandemic. So we have seen uptick on, on attacks on the press, but I think that's only part of the answer because it, you know we're going through a period globally where we see sort of a broader illiberal or authoritarian wave that is going around the globe uh, that, that sees journalists uh, as legitimate targets, that sees them as enemies or that sees them as, as traitors. And, and this attitude is, is what is, I think, very much driving uh, these new attacks these new attacks around the world. And we see this, you know, strengthening existing authoritarian forces like in China, we see in Hong Kong, not only press freedom, but the really all basic rights, you know, disappearing before our eyes and also emboldening, you know, new authoritarian forces if you look at places like the Philippines or, or Brazil. So, you know, the, the space for independent media is, is shrinking fast, but it was shrinking fast already before the pandemic. And if you want now, it's shrinking even faster. And, and as far as the situation in Europe goes, I mean, we, unfortunately, we see a, more or less a similar, a similar situation. Um, you know, I, I point, for example, to the report of the Council of Europe platform on, for the protection of journalists, which IPI is a member of, um, which, which released a report earlier this year saying that, you know, attacks on the press were becoming the new normal and that this needed to be, this needed to be prevented. I mean, even if you look, we have within the European Union at the moment still two unsolved cases of, of journalist murders. Um, we have a rising atmosphere of online attacks. We have a rising atmosphere of smear campaigns. Um, and this is all contributing to an environment in which the press, you know, uh, a rising atmosphere of self-censorship, a rising atmosphere of fear, of loss of public trust and support. And, and this matters for independent journalism. So it's, it's not just, you know, this, this business issue, but the press is under attack and, and that, has a, that has a consequence. Um, but with regards to Europe, I just actually want to underscore sort of two key issues that we, that we see as trends um, that, that, are, that are negatively impacting the independent press. And the first of this is what we call uh, state or, or state-led capture of, of the media, which, which we understand as the manipulation or the instrumentalization of, of national institutions, which, which, which means both you know, the state bureaucracy and regulatory bodies but also sort of more abstract institutions like the rule of law and, and the courts and, and the free market itself, as well as the abuse of state resources to, to basically exert what we call effective control over the media so that you have a situation which, uh, you know, states are able to control the flow of news and control the message, but also have this sort of plausible deniability, uh, which is the great advantage of this method. And you, so you have a situation which, you know, democratic institutions still exist, you have regulatory bodies that make decisions, you have courts that hear and accept cases, you have a market that exists. Uh, so you can't say that these institutions have been eliminated, uh, but they're being steered toward a particular outcome. Um, and, and this is typically, you know, a particular message or a set of pro-government media outlets. Uh, you know, so you have independent media that exist on paper, but in practice they're under the control of, of, of government allies. Um, and in some cases, you know, so that's sort of state-led control, state-led media capture. And in other cases, you have sort of more classical uh, media capture, which is, you know, the subversion of, of the state to private interest. And we see a lot of this sort of oligarchization of, of the media in many states in Central and Eastern Europe, where, you know, media owners uh, have a lot of different business interests and are using their media outlets as vehicles uh, for their own interests. But this is really a, a growing phenomenon across Europe. 
um, you know, the, the use of state advertising to feed, to, to, to feed pro-government media and starve critical media. Uh, we see, you know, uh, courts uh, are, are controlled by state allies uh, and, and, and media, you know, critical media that, that come into legal battles are not getting a fair hearing. We see, for example, even things like uh, competition bodies uh, that are controlled by the state that block mergers of independent media, which can strengthen their position in the market, or that approve mergers of a pro-government media as a way of creating these sort of blocks of, of propaganda media. So all of this is going on, and there are many examples. The master of this tactic, of course, is Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, which which has done a which you know has done a highly effective job of of dismantling media freedom over ten years without arresting journalists, without raiding media outlets, without criminalizing journalism per se. Uh, but there are many other examples, you know, Turkey is, is an example, Bulgaria, in other countries we see this sort of oligarchization, which, which is a related phenomenon. So, so that's one thing that is, that is very concerning to us uh, regarding Europe. And the other thing is, is obviously the intense financial pressure on independent media. And these issues are linked, you know. Media that are in a weaker, weaker financial position are vulnerable to state capture, and state capture is used to economically weaken independent media. And, and if you want, media are now facing this third financial crisis. The first was the digital disruption, then we had the 08 financial crisis, and now we have the pandemic, uh, which is, is ironic in a way because people need news now more than ever, and, and many media are receiving enormous amounts of traffic from readers. You know, I, I talked to one editor who said, every day is election day for us back in March and April. Traffic was so huge, uh, but because of the drop in advertising, even if they gained some, you know, additional subscribers, it wasn't enough to make up for the huge revenue losses. And, and that is happening everywhere. And, and that is a problem. It is a huge problem, but it is not an economic problem. Or it is not just an economic problem because media are not just any business. Uh, but independent media in particular are a fundamental pillar of democratic society. And so I think we need to understand that this business crisis is a societal crisis. Um, and, and, it's, and it's occurring at, at, at a time of an intense need for independent information. And it's also, you know, the weakening of independent media is also exacerbating this, this, this disinformation that a wave that we see. So, you know, I think it's, it's important to see this. This isn't about the business plan of this media or that media. I mean, it is in a micro sense, but, but in a macro sense, it's about protecting independent media as an institution, protecting independent news as an institution. So I think that we need to approach this as, you know, media as an essential business, as something that's really, that's really too big to fail. So those are, the, those are two issues that are, in our view, uh, going on at the moment. And as I said, I think they're, they're also interrelated. So, that's maybe as a way of introduction from, from my side. Thanks very much, Scott. That is a really insightful and uh, introduction to this panel. Uh, lots to chew on there. Um, I, I wonder, I'm, I'm going to turn to you, Mira, next. Um, Scott's highlighted, you know, a, a number of restrictions on, on press freedom. Uh, that affect uh, independent journalism and, um, you know, obviously outlined a number of what I think you could call insidious trends uh, that um, are shrinking the, the space for independent media in general. Uh, I wonder if uh, just building on those comments and, and from your perspective um, in, in the context of media development, uh, what are the changes you've seen recently and, and what do you see uh, as, as the major challenges? The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, and uh, thank you, uh, my colleague panelists and uh, all of you who are joining us uh, this afternoon. I will just uh, continue um, um, on some of the points that uh, um, Scott has uh, made uh, really well. Um, especially uh, the ones related uh, to financial pressures and the economic uh, and business crisis of journalism. Because as you have heard, in order to keep safe, in order to be able to respond to threats, in order to be able to keep the, the newsroom running, uh, it costs a lot of money. In order to produce investigative report in Europe, it's at least uh, 30,000 euros for a small story uh, in Eastern and Central Europe. Um, and um, 
all of these things uh, have been increasingly difficult to keep up uh, around the world. And I will give some of the figures uh, in terms of uh, what we are facing and uh, where we are. Um, in terms of the power of uh, the journalism and media sector, but also relations between different uh, economic powers that are shaping our uh, information markets, our information sector, but also our journalism sector. So for instance, what we are seeing all over the world is the uh, so-called news deserts. Uh, in Canada, for instance, uh, we have seen that uh, between 2010 and 2020, at least one third of Canadian jobs in journalism have disappeared. In United States, we have seen a disappearance of 2,100 local newspapers over the past 15 years. And those are some of the most developed countries in the world, including the UK that has lost 245 local news titles and some of the regions in the UK don't have a single local news outlets. And then when you look at, for instance, Brazil and some other uh, developing countries, 30 million people in Brazil, or about 15% of the country's total population, live without a single professional news source. And then in Venezuela, over the last uh, 10 years, close to 200 local community radio stations went to fair in Venezuela. What has happened? Of course, we all know the decline of uh, advertising income has been something that has shaken the traditional business model uh, very hard. Uh, this means that newsrooms around the world have lost around 60 billion or more than a half in, rev in revenues over the last 15 years. This is huge. News business used to be a powerful force. And that uh, news business was able to be a pillar of democracies and be kind of a balance and do their accountability role because it was a powerful force. That power of power, economically especially, is decreasing. And of course, number of journalists that they can hire is decreasing. Then COVID comes and what we are seeing, there was a fantastic survey from the International Federation of Journalists. We are seeing that two thirds of all the journalists worldwide are facing either job loss or commission cuts or pay cuts. So we are seeing that the trend that was really negative and was detrimental for a lot of our news ecosystems, especially local news providers and community news providers is deteriorating um, at a rapid scale. On the other side of all of this, we have a huge digital news market emerging. We call it news market, information market emerging. There is no space for professional journalism in terms of sustainability in that new digital, digital world. And that is one of the biggest problems because when we talk about the business model for journalism, we're trying to define the issue just by looking at how to solve the problem of journalism itself. On the other side, we have had the development of the whole new market for information. And for instance, at the moment, if you look at digital, more than 50% of people in some countries get their news from digital. So what's happening? YouTube alone has published that last year, their income was around $15 billion on an annual basis. All newspapers and digital news publishers, plus magazines in the world have earned less. And that's that power disbalance. So when we are looking at finding a business model for journalism, we also need to realize that the attention of audiences is limited and the amount of content that they're getting from digital platforms is becoming unlimited and is influenced, funded and shaped increasingly by digital platforms. In that space, journalism and professional media is hugely disadvantaged. So this is on the advertising side. On the subscription side, for instance, all the news publishers around the world have earned around five to six billion last year. 
that's exactly how much Netflix has earned from subscriptions. And this is continuing trend. And while these markets are growing at the rate of 20% per year, journalism is still declining. And this year, because of COVID, we are seeing 25% of decline. And I'm sorry, and I apologize to those of you who don't like numbers, but for me, they're, they're really um, illustrative of, of what we are facing and how little funding there is for journalism. And so to go back to that business model, just quickly, when we are in media development, looking at the business model 20 years ago, it was leading transitional countries, the newly democratic countries towards established commercial business model. That is not there anymore. There is no established commercial business model. Today, there is a new nonprofit hybrid business model, especially for local news. And that hybrid business model consists of commercial income that's less advertising, more subscriptions, membership fees and local philanthropy, international donor giving and international philanthropy, uh, and finally subsidies. But unfortunately, as we has, have heard in many of the countries around the world, state subsidies are actually used by state to capture media space. So we are seeing um, a very complicated uh, scene and picture, very challenging, and uh, the odds are against journalism. There are so many fights to fight, uh, and there are very few of us. So um, I hope I will have a chance to say something about maybe potential solutions and what we need. But thank you. You will indeed, Mira. Thank you for that. Um, I'm really um, struck by the theme that has developed through the first two speakers here about the combination of the business crisis facing the news um, business and journalism generally coupled with the um, divided attentions uh, of your audience and how those work together to, to make um, independent journalists, uh, journalism a, a less powerful force and a less able to play the role that we need it to play in, in democracies. Um, I hope we can, can come back to, to that. Uh, we're very fortunate to have on our panel today uh, people with firsthand experience of, of what happens when uh, independence of media gets taken away. Fortunate for the panel, not so fortunate for uh, uh, the individuals in, in question. Um, Martin, could I turn to you? Um, the paper that you worked on uh, for 15 years was uh, the subject of a, of a hostile uh, and, and, uh, and political uh, takeover. Um, or seemingly politically motiv motivated takeover. Uh, I wonder if you could just talk us through uh, what happened there as you experienced it. Well, it's always very complicated. You know, they are meant to be complicated. That, us, that at the end, uh, the, the Hungarian government can tell we have nothing to do with it but you have to look at their track record so it's never the single case it's always the sum of cases which show the intent um it is always a long story till they actually bring uh, a big publishing house to fall um it was a, a long story with nip sabachag as well uh, in 2010, as they came to power, they started to reorganize uh, ownership structure in the Hungarian media landscape. At that time, we still had a few uh, strong uh, international publishing houses, and Nev Sobocsák uh, used to belong to such a powerhouse. Ringe, which was a Swiss firm, um, since 175 years in the publishing business. and they wanted to sell their assets in Hungary to Springer, another traditional German uh, publishing house. And uh, the Hungarian government vetoed this deal. And they forced the two main players, Springer and Ringier, to sell a part of the portfolio to a third party. And it was their complicit uh, um, uh, pseudo uh, uh, um, 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 a serious looking 
but actual shady businessman from Austria sitting in Vienna as right now you are, Heinrich Petzina. And this Heinrich Petzina bought our newspaper. And after two years, he has delivered this newspaper to the, uh, to the uh, number one oligarch and best friend of Viktor Orban. Now Heinrich Petzina is well known in Austria as well, not because he is a good businessman, but because Heinz Christian Strache, former uh, vice chancellor of Austria, has spoken about him in the well-known Ibiza video. He is talking about Heinrich Petzina, who has rearranged the Hungarian media market in favor of Mr. Orban. And, um, and the, the, the journalist who uh, Strache was referring to, uh, one of the journalists who Petzina was, refer for, uh, Strache was referring to is sitting yet opposite to you. Um, so, this, this was the story back then in 2016. But as I said, this is only uh, one small step in a long, long uh, fight to uh, rule over the Hungarian uh, media landscape. I always try to uh, stress this idea of, of you know, uh, the, the lions uh, um, hunting zebras, they always take the weakest. So, so it's, it, it's been the last 10 years a, a constant play to weaken uh, the, 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 the remaining free outlets and, and always attack the weakest. They were able to attack in 2014 Origo, uh, that time biggest news portal and they have made a propaganda machinery out of it. In 2016, they were able to take down Nebsabadchag and close it, shut it down. They destroyed uh, a major part of the Hungarian newspaper readership. They never, uh, and they never subscribed to any other political newspaper. So people who used to read quality news started not to read it. Um, and 2018, they were able to turn Magyar Nemzet, another conservative, uh, good critical newspaper. Uh, they were they they, they entered uh, here TV uh, a news channel, and this year they have brought Index, this time biggest news portal, to 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 to, to turn and to 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 be much less critical as they used to be. So it is always a track record. Thanks very much, Martin. It's um, uh, it's it's really striking um, how um, these things they don't happen overnight, as you say, and uh, and and with people's attentions very seriously divided uh, between global pandemics and and also just the general press of uh, of daily life. It's it's really hard to track this sort of thing in a way that is 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 meaningful and, and gets the attention that it deserves. So th thanks for that um, uh, description. I I'd like to turn now to you, Natalia. Uh, welcome to the panel. Uh, our previous panel, I don't know if you had a chance to, to watch it, but it discussed how journalists can become target uh, targets of states or other powerful actors when they do critical reporting. That's something you have uh, a lot of personal experience with, of course, um, and were banned from Russia because of your, your investigative work. Um, what you've also done, however, is create a new uh, media outlet, a new um, uh, independent media organization. Uh, tell us about that, uh, how it worked, and, and, and what you confronted in, in setting up the organization. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to speak uh, to all the people participating in this event. But first of all, before coming and talking about my personal experience, I would just like to mention that the first two speakers, Scott and Mira, uh, they just created a sentiment of deja vu in my head because when I was preparing to that uh, panel, um, um, I was just writing all their thoughts on my um, paper. Uh, as, I, as I'm feeling, uh, it doesn't matter from which country you're coming from, um, everybody who is trying to make independent journalism now is facing the same problems. First of all, uh, this economical survival, which, is, which was extremely uh, hard in capital 
African states like Moldova was until recently, and actually it's not, uh, um, it's still not a free state because all state institutions are controlled by a small group of people with business interests. They are controlling the biggest part of media market with all state controlled institutions like anti-monopoly agency or audiovisual council, um, ignoring totally the problems of independent media and protecting totally the pro-governmental media. So everything the same in uh, in Moldovan case, just just uh, deja vu deja vu feeling, uh, guys. Uh, talking about personal experience, actually, actually, it's it's not my personal experience. In case of TV8, I, which I'm a co-founder of, it's an experience through, through which each Moldovan journalist was passing through uh, during last couple of years. Um, uh, until 2019, we've been officially called a captured state in the middle of Europe, where an oligarch who was controlling a governing party uh, was control, controlling all state institutions, central prosecution, government, parliamentary majority, um, intelligence service, and all the state institutions were used against uh, opponents, and not only political opponents, also against independent media. Like TV8, we have not a very long experience, just three years and a half since uh, our launch, but in that short history, we, we had it all. We... Um, um, state-controlled audiovisual council uh, was banning um, transfer of TV license to our NGO. We are the only um, TV channel in Moldova, which is a non-governmental organization. And we were banned to receive a TV license. And only with the support of European partners, it, uh, it was possible. After that, we passed like everybody. Our phones were listened. Me personally, for example, I was... Uh, filmed with a hidden camera in my own apartment and later uh, blackmailed with a sex tape uh, with me and my partner making sex like it will be shown to the whole country if you don't shut up uh, it, it was normal in an oligarchic state where an oligarch who was controlling all the party all the power was also having his own uh, um, private um, forces to to um, um, uh, to, to listen our phones, so every journalist like me was under uh, under permanent psychological psychological attack. For example, I was not feeling safe myself in my home because I saw hidden videos filmed with hidden camera in my in my apartment, which nobody should have access to except me. You understand that? Or for example, uh, we've been. Um, um, quite often targeted with uh, massive disinformation campaigns like our charts, our SMS charts being published, or last year after the oligarch f f um, flew the country, there was a big investigation about hundreds of civil society activists, journalists, and opposition leaders being filmed, uh, uh, listened. So we've been always uh, 24 hours uh, per day controlled by by state controlled institutions and by private uh, 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 private forces of that oligarch but you know we took it as a kind of new normal because in case of independent media you should not only do correctly your work you should not only find money for your for, for doing your correct work um, in in conditions of an absolutely unfair uh, competition but you should all you should also invest almost all your time and effort to uh, to respond to numerous cases in courts because you are always sued in courts by all these uh, bad guys let's call them you invest your time in answering uh, nu numerous uh, disinformation uh, campaigns launched by hundreds of trolls uh, uh, you can just get up like it was in my case you just get up and you see your phone with hundreds of messages of oh my god natalia what is happening and i find out that all uh, oligarch, oligarch controlled uh, channels uh, the biggest six channels are starting the day with the news, fake news about the channel I work for or about me, what, what my job. And it was a kind of, it was a kind of normal. Thanks God in last year, it started to be a bit better. 
But what we see now is that one oligarchy group was just replaced by another pro-governmental, uh, another government, which has same habits. And as we feel it in, for example, we are now in the middle of presidential campaign, uh, we see how they use this uh, Russian tactics to uh, name all independent media um, uh, spies financed by Western governments. Like even today, uh, before starting this uh, event, I was reading the news and I saw how pro government, uh, governmental socialist party uh, with which is its unofficial leader is our president who is running for the second mandate. He's known for his pro-Russian, his love for Putin and uh, and Russia. They started a huge again, a campaign against all independent media, including TVA, that we are financed by donor community. And if you are financed by donor community, uh, uh, it means that you are a spy and they should think about uh, what to do with all these NGOs and all the civil society groups and media which are financed, supported by donors. And here I get back to what uh, my previous speakers uh, told about. When you live in conditions on F of totally unfair competition, where anti-monopoly agency ignores the cartel agreement which was introduced on media market in Moldova uh, for almost four years ago between two biggest media groups controlled by former oligarch Plahotniuk and our actual uh, uh, president Igor Dodon. And anti-monopoly agency didn't, they just ignored that 70% of advertising market was controlled by these two media groups. Tell me please, how can we independent channel f get money from advertising market, which is this 30% which is for everybody else, everybody else. But in conditions when you live in state capture, there is also one more component which should be taken into consideration. Businesses are always afraid by those who control the state. Because if state controls uh, state prosecution like a political instrument, business will always listen to his intu to intuition. Should I go and finance this independent channel? Oh no, I should better go and put all my money for advertising to uh, to uh, pro-governmental channels because it will be kind of kind of support of uh, of power and this is how we have lack of advertising because of political motives because business is also under political pressure we have lack of money because of uh, because of um, pandemic because pandemic affects everybody we have lack of uh, money i'm really sorry of telling that but mira is absolutely right because of these huge giants like youtube or facebook for example facebook doesn't make monetization in moldova because our market is too small for them uh, and all all money from Facebook ads goes to them if for example facebook would make monetization in moldova our channel would be the number one because we have the biggest number of views, but we can't make money on that. We can't. We make, uh, uh, same on YouTube. On YouTube, we, ha we, uh, we have uh, one of the biggest number of um, views on Moldovan YouTube, if we compare with other medias, but we have maybe 2,000, 3,000 euro per month, when I'm really sorry, we have 90 people to pay salaries monthly. So you have all of this, all of this put together and, and, in parallel with all this psychological atmosphere of being target of discreditation campaigns, trolls write, writing about you, all this fake news. So it's quite hard, I would say, to sum it up. Just don't, I don't want to monopoly, uh, monopolize the, the floor, I'm sorry. No, Natalia, thank you for that. That's really, you know, your personal account uh, is really powerful, and um, I, I think I speak for everyone here on the panel when, so, you know, really um, very sorry for the personal strain that that intimidation campaign would put you and, and your colleagues uh, on. And you know, obviously, journalists can't bear the whole weight of um, of, of bringing the opposition uh, forward in any country. Um, and so one, one thinking about the purpose of this event today, you know, one question we want to try to answer is how can the Media Freedom Coalition engage in ways that um, 
that uh, that help without playing into the hands of those who seek to present journalists as spies and uh, agents, uh, foreign agents. Uh, that's a that's a tough question. Also, very tough to. Um, to, to sort of find the pegs for engagement when a lot of the um, the, the, the trends that you describe uh, constitute micro events, like a, a lot of um, uh, small individual uh, events that um, that add up to something very serious, but on their own would not necessarily provoke other governments to respond. And so that's uh, those are kind of some of the questions I hope we can get into. But let's come back to the money. Uh, because I think the, the financing issues come out really loud and clear here. Um, I'll go back to you, Scott. You're the first one who raised it, and it's it's been the theme uh, throughout uh, this panel so far. Uh, just the link between business models and um, independence uh, of journalism generally. Um, I, I just would like you to describe, um, you know, beyond what we've already heard about YouTube and, and some of the online platforms, what are the obstacles to, to financing um, and setting up uh, independent media organizations uh, and, and what models are, are out there that, that we should focus on and, and can contribute to? Yeah, uh, thanks Thanks for that question. Maybe just, just at the start to say, you know, I think especially in the case of Hungary, for example, we also have a situation in which, um, you know, the European Union has not upheld its own laws and principles. Um, you know, there are tools in place in particular to protect against this kind of market distortion that we see in Hungary, uh, as, as others mentioned, you know, the abuse of competition law, the abuse of um, things like state aid to, to use state advertising to fund, to fund media outlets. And, and the fact is that the EU ha has allowed over the past 10 years uh, these types of developments uh, to, to take place in, in, in countries like Hungary. Um, and so there are things that can be done. You know, it's just that it's just that those principles are not being are not being upheld, not enough pressure has has been applied. Um, so, so that is a serious problem, I think, and the needs that still hasn't been addressed. And, and we still are talking about you know, the conditionality of funding, for example, to EU states. We haven't, we haven't solved that problem yet. We haven't solved the problem of this market manipulation in places like Hungary, even though it flouts EU competition law. So these are, there are still things that, that can be done. Um, maybe just, just briefly on, on, your, on your question, I mean, I think one thing is that we have an issue, uh, you know, talking about ensuring independence from owners and things like that. I mean, we, we obviously need investment in media. Uh, but we need the right investment and and we have a lot of issues uh, as i mentioned at the beginning with with owners who instrumentalize media for their own economic and political interests um so, so we need investment in journalism but, but we need invest owners who invest in journalism and, and not themselves um and and that is a, a big problem in, in central europe in, in particular with all these with this oligarchization and we have countries like the czech republic where nearly all mainstream media now is in the hands of oligarchs who have cross interests in other economic areas and, and in many cases we fear that you know media purchases are a vehicle really to, to promoting those interests and, and there should you know we also need to look at legal solutions to that and one thing that happened in Hungary was you know uh, one of the first things that Orban did was loosen up these types of laws about uh, cross media ownership and pushing for media companies out of the country uh, and just today actually IPI and other press freedom organizations sent a letter to Peter Kellner who is the richest a uh, person in the Czech Republic who just bought uh, uh, Central European Media Enterprises for, for 940 million, uh, which includes 30 television channels reaching 45 million people in, in Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. Massive, uh, massive reach, massive interest. And this is someone who has uh, a conglomerate, a business conglomerate with interests all over the place. So we've sent an op open letter today asking him to commit to protecting the editorial independence of, of his media outlets. Um, but, but these are types of developments that are happening all the time. Um, I think that what I, would, what I would say, what I would use my time to, to plead for really is that, you know, of course, we can talk a lot about these uh, market solutions, subscriptions, um, membership, these are all very important. We, IPI advocates also very strongly for, for the use of public funds. Uh, to support independent journalism. And, and as I said before, independent media is, is not just a business. They are, these aren't just regular businesses, but we're talking about a public good. Quality journalism is a public good. 
and, and we do think that governments have a role to play uh, in providing financial support to media, especially now at a time when the media is under pressure. Obviously, there are huge, there are huge caveats here, you know, and, and there is this massive issue. And we know that states use public funds to steer media outcomes. We know that they use them to feed pro-government media and starve other media. We know that. Um, but, and, and obviously we need to protect against risks that there is influence or the perception of influence, which is equally as problematic, but we think that it can be done. It is possible. There are models that exist. There are ways to safeguard independence. I would just offer as, as an example, IPI has a, a fund uh, for cross-border investigative journalism, the IJ4EU, uh, which is funded 90% uh, by the European Commission and which, which you know, provides grants to investigative journalism projects. Um, but, but we've designed it in a way to keep political influence completely out. So we, uh, we run the program completely with no influence from the commission, but more importantly, the projects themselves, the grants themselves are selected solely by an independent jury of journalists, in this case led by Wolfgang Kack from the Süddeutsche Zeitung. The donors have no role in selecting the projects. We don't select the projects, but a jury does based on clear and transparent criteria. Um, and, and so, you know, this, it, it can be done. There are models uh, that exist. And, and I think it is important to look at these because of the uh, intense uh, economic pressure that we have on media, especially during the pandemic. And because, as I said before, this is the media are a public, independent journalism is a public good. And, and we need to protect it as long as we have um, the proper safeguards in place. Thanks, Scott. I'm going to go back to Mira now, and uh, you know, on, on the same theme, really. Uh, you you've already spoken, Mira, about um, uh, the fact that the pressure to generate revenue is slowing the um, development of independent media or, or, or harming it. Um, I wonder if you could talk about other uh, viable models, nonprofit models, for example, or other models. Um, and um, and also, could you maybe return to the theme of uh, the online shift, uh, the, the the increasing shift to online media consumption, uh, and how how that in impacts independence uh, and sustainability, um, and 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 what can be done about it? You tantalizingly suggested you'd like to come back to some uh, uh, prescriptions, and uh, this is a great time to to speak to that. Well, thank you for that question. That's uh, that's my favorite um, theme to to torture my friends with uh, afternoon coffee. But uh, um, I think that's the key, um, actually. And I'll quote uh, Emily Bell from Columbia University, who said that we are um, at a time of almost a constitutional moment for the future of media and journalism. And we require a big change and big rethinking. And just to link to Scott's point on public, uh, uh, public funding, when we had new technologies like radio, you, you had big decisions like in the UK and Canada to, to start public service broadcasting and preserve that public good role of information and uh, make sure that there is balance, that there is uh, independence, that there are uh, due processes, uh, that there is an arm length uh, a division between those in power and those running these institutions. Then even in the US, you had fairness doctrine with, uh, with broadcasting uh, television. In Europe, of course, great tradition of public service media and support for minority and diversity uh, and media pluralism. With digital, we have none of those. And we have this system that now produces most of our information that we could consume. And one of the major things for us, including the Media Freedom Coalition, is to look back at their own backyard and produce the leading groundbreaking policy in terms of regulating not digital content what, that we do trying to address misinformation but digital markets so that the public good role of information and journalism is secured in these spaces and european union is working on some of these policies canadian government as well so this is really important uh, in addition to that there are so many instruments that need to be developed including 
uh, charitable status for uh, for journalism. Again, Canadian government is doing at the moment something along those lines. Germans are looking uh, at that as well. Um, tax relief, at, uh, other kinds of, uh, of support mechanisms, and of course, support for local, independent, investigative journalism especially. But then in countries where these are often abused, there are mechanisms, especially now that we are looking at the post-COVID recovery, to link to, to what uh, Scott was saying about Hungary and the rule of law mechanism in Europe that hasn't been used to, to condition some of the, um, um, some of the financial uh, flows. There is uh, a lot of uh, financial assistance going from development uh, institutions and development banks. And this is something that we are raising only now, that there needs to be some kind of mechanism where uh, the international community works together with the countries to make sure that when assistance is going or development money is going into different countries, that there is also um, a guarantee that journalism, accountability journalism, will not be under pressure. Because this is the only way also to make sure that those funds are not abused and that the, the corruption doesn't, doesn't eat it. So those are two things. Of course, finally, international development aid that goes into the media field. Uh, and also philanthropy funding of, of journalism. Uh, that's something that at the moment is not just a temporary aid until those media and journalism organizations become commercially sustainable. Commercially sustainable, big scale business model will wait for another 10 or 20 years. So, so this kind of assistance needs to become a big scalable system and what Scott was mentioning as the model for allocating some of the funds, uh, we need to work all together to, to see how we can increase the level of funding available. At the moment, it's around 500 to 600 million dollars uh, um, uh, per year globally, which is far from what's needed. Um, so how can we together work to scale this assistance? How can we work with other international development uh, assistance sectors to make sure that, for instance, public service announcements are not going to um, oligarch media systems or Facebook, but, but to good nonprofit uh, um, quality journalism outlets? And, uh, and finally, uh, to, to make sure that we have systems where the money will be uh, quick, will be sufficient and will address the needs of those on the ground uh, really efficiently. So those are three things I think really big, really challenging, uh, but uh, I think that we, we, we need to, to work together uh, to try to achieve them. Thanks, Mira. We have about five minutes left in this panel, and I want to um, throw uh, one last question to each of Martin and Natalia, if, if I may. Martin, uh, Martin, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about how uh, any independent media is surviving uh, right now in, 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 your, uh, in your region, uh, and what is the, the best way to support projects in your view and we've heard some um, some possibilities from Mira and from Scott but uh, uh, how, how can media best be supported uh, in, in your country? Well I can uh, tell you about our biggest dilemma um, because we lost our public uh, broadcast 10 years ago as um, the government Orban has entered uh, the, um, the state-owned media and made a propaganda machinery out of it. So the main problem is that the remaining critical news outlets feel, obli uh, feel themselves obliged to somehow uh, step in the role of the public broadcast media to try to give uh, unbiased and uh, and uh, well uh, uh, fact-checked news to everyone but at the same time this is not uh, the you know this is not uh, what private media enterprises are there for so who is financing the public uh, uh, broadcasts um, uh, aim if the public broadcast is not doing it. Mm -hmm. um, 
we started a year ago uh, an online subscription model but there is a huge debate within uh, uh, within um, uh, elites whether it is um, it is ethical to uh, make uh, online news um, on a subscription uh, model as uh, a lot of people will lose contacts to the last uh, well uh, fact checked news so who is there to run the public service if the public service is not guaranteed anymore and then this is a huge a huge problem and 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 and, and a, an answer which we can't uh, really uh, answer you know it's it's the same today we there's going to be a football match um, champions league football match a, a hungarian uh, club uh, made it to the final round for the first time in in decades uh, here at HVG, we don't have a sport uh, uh, news team, so we only have political journalists. Of course, because all the time we had to cut uh, uh, costs, we said that all right, we can we can somehow manage without sport journalists, but we have to keep our focus on politics, on hard news. But at the same time, we need the clicks to survive. We, we it is it is you know laming because you either have advertisement revenue on a very, very troubled market because of the Hungarian government, or you are asking money for a subscription model which cuts off people from, from uh, reading facts checked in news. And now this evening, there's the football match, and to have the best, the, the most clicks out of it, political journalists are going to uh, live commentate uh, the match for us and it means that tomorrow there's there's going to be two or three political journalists not uh, not coming to work because they have to sleep because of a football match this is not how it should and supposed to work you know i don't know how how you know i'm not a policymaker so i'm i'm not I, i'm not happy to answer about questions of of, 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 of outside financing. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the feeling from inside that you are less and less and you are doing more and more. And then you have this, this, this laming dilemma whether you are hurting, actually you are hurting with your, with your work or with your survival. The, the public service you, you can't do for everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin. Uh, that's uh, th that's great, um, and understand fully that y your role is not that of policy maker. I do hope you have some political journalists who know something about football if they're going to go uh, live live tweet that. Um, but in any case, good luck um, with that, Natalia. Just in the last two minutes of our our, our panel here. Uh, you know, you're facing a lot of the pressures that that have just been discussed, and 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 all of the personal pressures as well that that you've dis described uh, earlier in the panel. Um, and, and yet, you're very successful. Uh, you've received some awards for your your um, uh, your shows already. Um, could you describe some of the success factors that are making TV8 uh, work? And uh, and what advice you might have liked to have received uh, before you were setting up this organization? Uh, first of all, the biggest, uh, biggest success of our team is that we managed in uh, three years and a couple of months uh, since we've been launched to, uh, to have uh, the best audience online uh, compared with other channels. And we already compete with two old, um, um, uh, uh, with our two main competitors, uh, uh, which have um, more than 10 and 20 years on the market. So we uh, succeeded to uh, achieve the numbers and the audience numbers uh, and in online to have even better audience numbers in just three years without, with no money for marketing. And the explanation is very simple and it's just, it would be my advice for everyone who starts doing uh, new independent media projects in their countries. Just be crazy, go crazy, believe in what we, you are doing, and when the truth is on your side, 
at some point, even if the government or power is uh, um, is fighting against you, uh, uh, your citizens, audience, donors, uh, civil society start support you, and this becomes this becomes uh, a bigger power. People's power is sometimes becomes much bigger even even than oligarchs' power. And for example, nobody, everybody was considering us a crazy guys launching launching a new media during oligarch era uh, in 2017 but now the oligarch is running around the world and trying to find a safety place because he's he's already considered persona non grata in for example United States and he's afraid of criminal cases here in Moldova so we managed so just be crazy and believe in what you are doing Thanks very much, Natalia, and uh, thanks to all the, the panelists. I'm afraid that we don't have time in this panel to, to go to any questions uh, from, from viewers, but uh, it's, it's really great uh, to have had the luxury of such a rich panel uh, that leads us to this point in the proceedings uh, without any time left. I'm really grateful to, to all of you. I think we've seen today how, how far reaching attempts to influence and control media really um, uh, it can go and, and, and the deleterious effect that it can have on uh, access to information and, and pluralistic debates and ultimately the, the quality of our, um, of our, our democracies. You know? um, I, my big takeaway from, from this uh, discussion really does um, link back to um, early, uh, early comments regarding the, the link between uh, the, the business crisis in journalism and how that is also a democratic crisis um, and, and we don't always think of it in that way, uh, certainly in government circles. So that is really, um, uh, really, really useful. Um, I'm also quite encouraged by what I've heard from, from uh, Mira and others and Scott and others about um, some of the possibilities, you know, that, we're, that, that we can pursue uh, for, for loosening um, the constraints on independent media, whether it's a, a tax breaks or, or, or charitable status, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I would like to just really uh, thank you all very much. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll bring the uh, panel to a close with that. Um, we've taken really good note of uh, all of the, the comments and recommendations uh, that you've made. Barbara, I, I know that we are uh, at risk of running over time in exactly 60 seconds. So if you don't mind, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll go straight to the closing of the event if I, if I could. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been, been asked to conclude this, um, this, this um, uh, event on uh, media freedom uh, today. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the panelists from both of the panels for their, their invaluable contributions. I found it a really good use of, of two and a half hours of, of my time. Um, your, your comments have been extremely insightful uh, and really uh, help, help us um, highlight the challenges facing an independent uh, media and media freedom around the globe and the, the need to act to counter increasing attempts to, to suffocate that, that independence. Uh, as you demonstrate uh, very uh, personally, independent, pluralistic, and, and free press is, is essential uh, to the de development and maintenance of, of our democracies and for, for economic developments. I know I speak on behalf of all of the organizers today uh, to say that we are deeply concerned by the continued degradation uh, of media freedom around the world. Uh, according to the World Press Freedom Index, uh, prepared by Reporters Without Borders, the number of countries regarded as safe, where journalists can pursue their work in complete security, continues uh, to decline while authoritarian regimes continue to tighten their grip uh, on the media in lots of, uh, lots of areas. Uh, I think, seen from our perspective, it's quite clear that uh, bolder action is required on the part of governments, uh, as well as on the part of uh, international institutions, and, and the EU was mentioned in that regard today, uh, to address the evolving environment uh, in which uh, we all, and especially you all, uh, panelists, uh, find yourselves today. Uh, by the very nature of the global information ecosystem, media freedom is something that cuts across traditional notions of national borders and therefore, in our view, necessitates global cooperation uh, to protect. 
Uh, I'm very pleased to say that uh, Canada and the UK uh, take this extremely seriously and we're determined to be at the forefront of the effort to provide global leadership on media freedom, including as the co-chairs of the 37 Country Strong Media Freedom Coalition. Today's webinar and others like it throughout the world because this is not a unique event, will also feed into the second global conference for media freedom co-hosted by Canada and Botswana on November 16th of this year. This virtual conference will provide an opportunity to take stock of the impact of COVID-19 on the media landscape. Indeed, COVID-19 has highlighted the vital importance of media freedom exposed vulnerabilities and exacerbated the difficult economic situation of traditional media. The conference will also examine the new challenges and opportunities presented by the introduction of digital technology. We are confident that this initiative will constitute a small but important step in the international community's efforts to promote and protect press freedom. In the meantime, I would like to thank once again the panelists and all of the participants in today's webinar. Uh, you as, as journalists and as those seeking uh, to promote media freedom perform an extremely vital function and service to us all uh, as you reveal the injustices and, and give us facts to think more freely and critically about the world around us. Uh, thank you for your uh, inspirational uh, personal um, experiences that you've shared today uh, and, and thank you for being with us all. Have a good afternoon.